delighted to say that Martha Kellner from the uh, Mail is alongside me uh, tonight. Uh, we've got uh, plenty more to talk about. Trying, uh, for, I know for some of you who are, are really into your cycling, you'll have read all the stories about this. You know uh, lots of bits and pieces, and, and an awful lot of you as well, uh, some of you hearing some of this for the first time as well, to bring it all up to date. We thought it was time to do exactly that. And really, you can't talk about uh, uh, any story like this without uh, thinking uh, about the man who... Uh, uh, has just been one of the leaders in his field, uh, David Walsh, the Sunday Times chief sports writer, uh, the man that Lance Armstrong used to call little troll and the man really uh, vindicated and very much at the forefront of uh, all of that. David, it's uh, a delight to speak to you. Good evening. Good evening, Mark. Um, the, the first thing to say with all of this, this is um, another drip, drip, drip of a story with... Uh, uh, again, extraordinary uh, allegations, uh, extraordinary findings, and then, of course, within all of this, um, very close to home. Yeah, very much so. I mean, um, the sadness of it is that the British Cycling and Team Sky's extraordinary success uh, over the last, you know, more than 10 years has been has been really put under a cloud, has been tarnished. And, you know, you could easily argue, and I would argue, that it's, it's unfair to tarnish everybody with the same brush. But the problem now with doping is that, is that when, people, when, when, when people trust something and then they realize that trust has been betrayed, you know, even if it's been, if it's been betrayed by, a, by one or two people in a very big organization, they tend to just say, okay, I'm done. Uh, I, I, I'm just fed up of believing in something and then realizing that I believed in something that didn't really exist. And I think that is the case for British Cycling and for Team Sky. And I think David Brailsford has a lot to answer for in relation to this. And of course, uh, f from your vast experience uh, uh, of this, and not just in cycling too, is it, in the end, whatever the story is, the truth will out. And, um, you know, it, it, I, I'm, the way that you use the word sad, I completely agree with you. Um, I know that um, you, you've seen so many different things. You know what's going on. You see the end game. And then I, that there is still within me as well just hoping that British cycling comes out of this and proves that there's part of this that, um, you know, can still have them standing as our most successful Olympic sport ever. Yeah, well, um, I mean, I believe uh, um, that, that you know, the people who won the medals at the Olympic Games were, were riding clean. I really do yes. believe that. I believe that Chris Froome has won the Tour de France clean. Um, I think what Team Sky and, and, and Dr. Richard Freeman, who was a Team Sky doctor, but also a British cycling mm. doctor, and Dave Brailsford, who was, you know, at the time, he was Team Sky boss, but he was also boss of British cycling. I believe what they did with Bradley Wiggins in 2011, 2012, 2013 was unethical, and and unethical at the I would say unethical at the very least. Mm -hmm. There has been a presumption mark in all of this because what we're talking about here in the first instance was the the leak that Bradley Wiggins had been given therapeutic use exemptions for a very strong corticosteroid. That is, he was allowed to legally use a banned drug because of a medical condition. Now I believe that if you apply for that therapeutic use exemption without there being a, a genuine and proper clinical lead, need for that level of, of medication, because the in, intramuscular injection, 40 mg of triamcinolon, was a very serious therapeutic reaction to whatever Wiggins' situation was. You know, if you do that and the symptoms don't justify it, you have cheated. And mm. um, my belief is at the very least what Team Sky did was unethical because of the, the timing. These were injections given three days before the start of the 2011 Tour de France, four days before the start of the 2012 Tour. And, and to me that just stinks because what that says is here we are giving our rider, our lead rider, our number one rider, an injection of triamcinolone, very strong corticosteroid, just before the Tour de France, when in cycling, this is a known performance enhancer. This is a drug that's been spoken about for years under its brand names, Kenelog, Kenacort, as being, you know, in the arsenal 
of every doper, you virtually know, whoever doped. That, that, I mean, that's the thing, and, and the point that you make so well there, David, is that for everything about Team Sky and British Cycling and the minute details to get things right, to in any shape or form have any shadow cast over that by a drug totally um, used and abused within the sport throughout its shabby history is quite extraordinary extraordinary uh, and i mean the thing about sky that that really got up people's noses and i understood this at the time um even when i was totally a believer in in dave brailsford's methods and i i i i i admit i was at one time the thing that got people even when there was no evidence of any wrongdoing was that sky didn't just want to be seen as the best team they wanted to be seen which was an admirable um aspiration but they wanted to be seen as the cleanest of clean teams, which again was admirable. Mm. But if you set yourself up as wanting to be whiter than white, you, you can't deal in any shade of grey. And what they did with Bradley Wiggins, at the very least, was deal in that grey area between what is clean and what is dirty. And you cannot go there if you're Team Sky with the ethics that you're professing to have. And that's why the reaction against um, Team Sky has been, has been you know, pretty strong and robust and people because people have 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 felt let down not in a way because if you go back on the lance armstrong story mm. lance never set himself up as being whiter than white no. his defense was i passed the test yeah. uh, uh, you know which is a completely different line than sky were taking mm. what sky were saying is we're better than that mm. you know we're not a team that seeks to pass the test we're a team that's, that, that exists to play by the highest ethical standards. And, and the awful thing about this, Mark, the thing that really grates on, 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 on somebody like me who knows people in that, in, in that Sky team is that a huge amount of very good people in that team, people who would never have dealt in the grey areas, yeah. have been tarnished by what's happened. And that's why... Um, um, what has happened is, a, is an absolute travesty of fairness. Martha so, Kellner is alongside me here, and Martha, please. Hi, David. Um, I, I was wondering, do, do you think if if Bradley Wiggins has abused this TUE system um, in order to to gain some sort of performance enhancing benefit, do you do you think that the way you see it, with all your experience of Team Sky, do you think it's that he's he's gone it alone, or you know, and it, it doesn't tarnish the rest of the team because they weren't involved? What, how, what well, do you think is the breakdown? Well, I, I think, Martha, that it does tarnish the rest of the team, even though that may be unfair, because mm -hmm. I think the rest of the team, with the exception of the head coach at the time, Shane Sutton, with the exception of Dave Brailsford, who was the boss of the team, and with the exception of Dr. Richard Freeman, there are the three people who knew all about this. Mm -hmm. These were these were. I mean, Richard Freeman has said it in his in his written submission to the select committee. You know, I did this with the approval of of head coaches, not head coaches. I say head coach. Mm -hmm. And Tim Carrison, who's the kind of really the performance guru at Team Sky, Tim Carrison would not have countenanced this in my eyes. Mm -hmm. Rod Ellingworth, I know that the, the, another performance guy, very highly rated in the team, he, was totally, he, would have, he would have been totally opposed if he had been consulted. But he wasn't. Chris Froome wasn't consulted. The other writers weren't consulted. This was done by a, a select group of powerful people mm -hmm. within Team Sky. Select, write down, as I said, four people. And, mm -hmm. and they are the four people who have destroyed something that really was mm -hmm hugely impressive and the irony another irony is that Brailsford is so good in so many ways yeah. I mean uh, I saw Bradley Wiggins in some you know speech rubbishing the whole idea of Martinell Gaines that's unfair Brailsford did a lot of things that were very good mm. but unfortunately he went with something in relation to these two UEs with Wiggins that he should never have gone with mm. he knows that now and it to me it's been like perfectly obvious mm -hmm. Yeah. That Brails this guy can only move forward if Dave Brailsford resigns because he is so associated with this. Um, David, uh, can we come back to you in just a minute? 
<laughs> well, a very good evening to you and uh, plenty of uh, you with uh, your thoughts tonight uh, at TalkSport, at TalkSport KO, at Martha Kellner, at Mark Saggers as well with your thoughts on this. Delighted to say at the moment David Walsh, the Sunday Times chief sports writer, is at it. Um, uh, David, just a, a lot of our listeners getting in touch tonight with uh, varying uh, different thoughts on this, some uh, fascinated by the insight that the likes of you and Matt Lawton and and Martha have, have given us, and, and others still wondering whether the British media constantly try to undermine any sporting success, as Simon C., for one, has mentioned. And, um, you know, everybody really now, and yet Martha has um, told us um, uh, so well earlier that we're still right in the heat and the middle of all of this, aren't we? Very much so. I mean, and, and, you, and you, you referenced Matt Lawton of the Daily Mail, Mark. Matt Lawton has done tremendous journalistic work on this story. But, you know, for, for your listener who wrote in, just, just let that listener put himself in, in Matt's position. When after Fancy Bears, the Russian hack site, you know, leaked documents, which were medical records of Bradley Wiggins and lots of other athletes around the world, medical records that showed basically that Bradley Wiggins had three TUEs before his three biggest races in 2011, 2012, 2013. We knew nothing about this. And we, we, we did know that Bradley Wiggins has said in his autobiography he'd never had an injection. And here we see he has three that, he, that we've never been told about. Then a journalist, or sorry, then... Um, a source rings up Matt Lawton and says, Matt, you've heard nothing. You know, you've seen nothing yet. So Matt says, what is it? And the guy says, tells him about a medical package delivered to Team Sky that he believes may have been, may have been a banned drug, with triumphs in London, that would, be, that would be permissible, used under a therapeutic use exemption, that was delivered to Team Sky on such and such a day. What is Matt going to do except investigate it like any proper journalist should? When he rings up Team Sky and says, can you explain this? They lie barefaced to him, um, Dave Brailsford in particular. They kind of concoct all kinds of stories. They basically, I mean, Dave hmm. Brailsford used, an used a sentence to Matt Lawton that I believe will, will, will always be there, you know, and I think it will destroy David Brailsford's legacy. And that sentence was, if you didn't write the story, is there anything else we could do? Yeah. Now, how do you explain that, Dave? But Dave Brailsford has never explained what exactly he meant by that. But that, to me, sounded suspiciously like an inducement not to write the story. I know that's, how Matt, that's what Matt felt it was. And to me, if you're operating in that, let's be very polite here and call it that grey area, that's not quite ethical and not quite moral, I don't think you deserve to be running a team like Team Sky that professes to be whiter than white. Mm. Uh, Martha? Yeah, I, I was wondering also the flip side of that, David, which I'm sure you'll have heard a, a million times, is that you also, if, if, if you don't investigate things, you get accused of being parochial and supporting the British athletes while you, you know, while you attack athletes from other countries, don't you? That's right. And I mean, Martha, you've done work on the, on, on the whole um, Russian athletic scene. Fantastic mm -hmm. story a couple of years ago that, that showed people what the Russians were doing. And w I've been doing stuff on the Russians and we're very quick. I mean, I enjoy exposing corruption in Russia because I think Russian sport is a very corrupt place. And that's what journalists yeah. should be doing. But when it happens on our own doorstep, we, we don't have the right uh, uh, to ignore it. And I would, I would go further than that. I think if it happens on our own doorstep, we have to be more rigorous, more mm. robust, and, and more damning if the evidence is there to be damning. Mm -hmm. It would be a dereliction of journalistic duty if, if Matt had have not reported that, as far as I'm concerned, if he'd, if, if he'd not reported that conversation with Dave Brailsford, because the, the public were in some ways being, being hoodwinked by, by people. No, no doubt about that. Mm. I mean, and, and that... That conversation that, that Matt had with David Brailsford, that to me will always stand as, as testimony to, to how serious the story was that Matt had. Matt had got wind of something. He, you know, sometimes, Mark, you don't realize how good a story you've got <laughs> until you put it to the guy who, who, who might be hurt by the story. And you see how upset or how nervous or how desperate he gets to stop you writing it. And you think, wow. I thought it was a good story, but now I realize it's a great story yeah. because of the reaction of the person who doesn't want to see it in print. You know that line about some 
who was a great editor who said, you know, um, um, news is what somebody doesn't doesn't want you to write. All yeah. all else is PR. Yeah, no, no, that's uh, perfect when it comes to this. And with your vast experience, obviously, right the way through Lance Armstrong and uh, and everything else, and and many other sports at the at the very highest level, uh, David. Where does marginal gains and success go wrong then to even if you're thinking that what you're doing is not against the rules, but it's as close as you can get to not being there? What what is the makeup? Is it that you're suddenly in a bubble? Is it is it the the appetite and thirst for so much more success after you've tasted it? Or, or what is it? I think it's a number of things. I think what happens um, with teams is that. Um, you, you know, you're in sport. If you're, you know, if you're going to be successful in sport, that means winning. And the way you win is that you prioritise winning. You put everything in place to ensure or to give you the best possible chance of winning. And then you come into kind of conflict situation where you think, well, we could do this. We're not sure though; it would be right. We're not sure that it's uh, that it's in line with our ethical standards. Even though we might get away with it, we probably would get away with it. Do we do it? And those are decisions that are going to maybe, you know, you, you made the decision that Sky made it. Maybe it helped. Maybe Triumph St. Lone helped Bradley Wiggins win the Tour de France. We don't know. We certainly know that he used it. And we know from other cyclists that it's a real performance enhancer. But, uh, see, uh, and I've said this already, but I would say it again. When, when Dave Brailsford talked about marginal gains a lot in the early years, I have to say I hated the expression marginal gains. <laughs> I hated the way he would talk about it because, you know, what he wanted you to think was that he was some kind of guru better than everybody else. Now, I believe he actually was innovative and that he achieved great things with British Cycling and with Team Sky. But he didn't need to be going boasting about it all the time and coming up with these clever kind of management speak type phrases to make himself, you know, look great. The performance should have done that. <laughs> uh, um, but it's, that's a small complaint and it's not really important. Sure. What is important is that when Dave Brailsford was confronted with the situation where Bradley Wiggins and Dr. Richard Freeman were applying for a TUE, Dave Brailsford's reaction was, well, we need this to be done correctly. Therefore, get, get an external consultant, which they did, Simon Hargreaves. And Simon Hargreaves, you know, agreed that this was the right medication. Conspicuously, I would say, they didn't consult the other four doctors working in Team Sky. None of them knew about those early TUEs. Um, they were, in a sense, um, they were part of it because they were doctors at Team Sky, sure. but they weren't part of it because they didn't know. Now, why didn't you have a more consultative approach to this, a more collaborative approach, which would get all the doctors around the table? Do we think this pretty extreme form of medication, form of therapy for Bradley Wiggins is justified? Mm. And, and get all the doctors' opinions. If they had, they would have heard a lot of dissenting voices. Uh, and, you know, so you make decisions like that. Obviously, you think because it's private, Bradley Wiggins' is private medical file, you think it's never going to come out. And you think, basically, that it's never going to be challenged. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, and, and maybe you could say, but Dave, you, you, David Walsh, you have a personal interest in this. You went embedded in Team Sky and you're a bit bitter now. I, I don't say I'm bitter but I am angry. I'm angry because when Dave Brailsford was inviting me into the team to come and see, see what we do, he didn't say, by the way, I should tell you that we've been getting TUEs for Bradley for the last two Tour de France's, and we're going to get him a TUE next year when you'll be with us for his biggest race of the year. That was kept really secretive. I didn't know it, and I could, you could say, well, you weren't much of a journalist. You didn't find that out. Well, Chris Froome didn't know it. Geraint Thomas didn't know it. All the top riders in the team, except Bradley Wiggins, none of them knew about these TUEs. It was done in a very secretive way. Look, some of the doctors in the team didn't know that the star rider was getting these TUEs. So that secrecy speaks to me of the fact that Dave Brailsford knew this was at the very least in that grey area and, and basically gambled that he would get away with it. Uh, David, it's great to talk to you. I'm a gambler, and I know what I want. I'm a gambler, and I know how to get it. I'm a gambler, and I know what I know, what I want.
Paranoia 